who is spying on your phone? This is a very complex and detailed topic. Many of you will be surprised at what I've discovered so far from years of research. Here we are in 2020, and unfortunately, I still don't know all the spying going on, but I know a lot of it. Hopefully, those of you in the know will contact me and add more information. In the meantime, stay tuned, and let's get started on learning about this phone spying. It may not surprise you that some spying is being done on your phone in 2020, but I guarantee that the extent of it will in fact surprise you. Some of it is done legally, some with some obscure government authority, and some are using government mandated back channels to hack us, and some are unexplained. Something is going on and slowly I'm seeing that we are being pushed into a level of surveillance and spying that I've never seen before. The more I learn, the more concerned I get because obviously there are secrets here and I don't know who knows the answer. I don't know who's pulling the strings. The more I learn though, the more I want a Linux phone with a kill switch for the cell modem. I've learned that trust is now something I cannot easily give. This will be a multi-part series. This video will be the introductory big picture. I intend to show you articles from the press, my private discussions with people in telecommunications, and use my own extensive cybersecurity experience to draw the current state of affairs in phone spying. None of what I talk about requires any tinfoil hat. I only talk about facts, and if I theorize something, it's based on common sense technical capabilities. So if you're interested in following this series of videos, please consider subscribing to this channel and click on that notification bell so you get the up-to-date information. As far as I'm aware, there are no YouTube videos that will go through the rabbit hole I will discuss. You often get this information in little bites and never in a comprehensive review. And like I said earlier, there are many parts to this to which I don't even have an answer yet. Perhaps some of those with direct connections with telecommunications companies like Qualcomm, MediaTek, Gemalto, and phone carriers can talk to me privately on my app Brax.me and add information or correct things I may mistake. First of all, spying on your phone involves so many parties. Government agencies, of course, do a lot of spying on your phone, but the spying is actually overlapping. Covert agencies do their own spying separately from law enforcement agencies and multiple covert agencies may spy independently with separate equipment. And there's foreign governments using the same channels as your national covert agencies. And I presume they're spying on those doing the spying, counterintelligence. Then there are the commercial interests or even the mercenary data mining organizations. Unlike the old days, a lot of the data processing for covert agencies has been delegated to third-party organizations many companies you're very familiar with, and they collect information and contract with the covert agencies to analyze the data. Some of this will be stored and maintained by the private companies, which by the way, are not subject to any kind of law to prevent this kind of data collection. And this enables governments to skirt privacy laws. Then there's the common carriers, meaning your phone company. They get direct access to the data and they do have the capability to spy on you. In fact, they are required to have this capability by law. Did you know that? And they're of course the hackers and other unknown entities that may deliberately target individuals. They're part of this equation too. So we have overlapping parties that spy on our phone. There's also a question of what data is being spied on. Clearly all metadata is fair game, such as who you're talking to, location information, and call times. But at differing levels, various parties may want to capture the actual voice conversation, whether an actual audio or voice over IP, such as that offered by Skype. I want to make clear that there's a capability to track cell data, voice over IP data, and internet data in general. And they can spot the internet traffic more exactly using something called deep packet inspection. Then there's the more unexpected metadata called the voice print. Apparently we can all be identified with a voice print. So regardless of what media is used to communicate with our voice, we are automatically recognized. Some data types are protected by law, specifically the actual voice communication. This falls under a special law in the US called Title III, which requires 
special authorization. But everything else, including a voice print, is not. So all data types are being spied on. There are many technologies used to hack our phones. As it turns out, there's equipment to listen in at the internet trunk level where the big chunks of the internet flow through. The internet superhighway, as they used to call it. There's equipment to listen in at the switching office level. There's equipment to hack our signals at the carrier level. There's methods to listen at the telecommunications infrastructure level internationally. Then there's direct ways to listen into the radio frequencies using specific devices at your location. And finally, there are apparently hacks directly into our phones. So there are overlapping technologies that can be used to spy on our phone. I've accumulated this research over many years, but for now we'll stick to the big picture. The backup research will come in future videos. I'm going to split what will follow in three categories. Network surveillance, over-the-air surveillance, and device surveillance. Number one, network surveillance. Let's start with some basic background on U.S. laws regarding phone surveillance. It shouldn't be a secret that three-letter agencies have been listening in to communications traffic all the way back to the invention of the telegraph. And this was formalized as a direct wiretapping into international phone traffic, particularly in World War II. This has been part of our legal system for a long time. In this video, I will specifically talk about U.S. surveillance as mandated by U.S. law. Each country will have their own versions of this. In more recent years, we have CALEA, the Communications Assistant for Law Enforcement Act of 1995. This mandates wiretapping capability for each U.S. carrier. They're required to allow wiretapping if requested by law enforcement. And this tapping includes voice over IP and internet traffic not just phone traffic. On top of this, the FBI apparently has its own network that compiles phone data called Digital Collection System Network, or DCSNet. As implemented today, apparently there are hardware intercept switches built into the phone company switching devices to enable deep packet inspection and even specific targeting of individuals. So this is some sort of hacker's tool like Wireshark that's on steroids. This is also built into multiplexer. I presume a good spot for these kinds of detection devices are right at the junction between an ethernet wired trunk and a fiber optic trunk where you find multiplexers. Multiplexers are like junction boxes for internet traffic. They are backbone routers. For years, I've pointed my attention to the fiber optic trunk providers like Level 3. They are definitely in a position to listen into most of the internet. Then I learned about peering stations, which apparently is another spot for these multiplexers. Something you will learn about in future videos. Some people who work in telecommunications have told me how they install these unknown hardware devices into multiplexers with a guard next to them, obviously indicating some top secret nature to what they're doing. And there are these top secret lock rooms and the telecom buildings that have been identified as doing interesting things to our traffic. This has been discussed in the press by insiders. There's a software side to Kalia wiretapping as well. Phone metadata is transported through a protocol called SS7. There was already a 60 Minutes show featuring SS7 and how it can be hacked, which can allow any third party to listen into calls, make calls, and spy on texting traffic, even internationally. So you can see here that once you built in some back door, it is always possible for some third party to attack it. Another government or some hacker. But what is not discussed is that China itself has been hacking these Kalia channels for many years, possibly through the SS7 protocols. And this is just the law enforcement side of things. Then there's the mass surveilling three-letter agencies. Make sure you understand the difference. Three-letter agencies doing mass surveillance do not have to comply with rules relating to evidence since they don't go to court. In essence, the three-letter agencies evade the law related to unreasonable search and seizure, which is guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment in the United States. Obviously, many countries don't have such a constitutional right. But there's new evidence in the news in 2020 that the FBI do phishing expeditions using the mass surveillance data. Access to this mass surveillance data was granted to the FBI 
by Obama before he left office. This mass surveillance was authorized by various telecommunication laws, the most recent of which is the Patriot Act and FISA, something we never question our elected representatives about. Once again, FISA was renewed without modifications in 2020. I will examine how this mass surveillance operates in a separate video, but I will discuss what is clearly a joint venture between the three-letter agency and AT&T and how internet and phone data is filtered and deliberately funneled by predefined word dictionaries and location filtering to the big facility in Utah. This was featured in a news article some years back after the Snowden revelations and shows the secret buildings with no windows and locked doors where these operations are occurring in. Mass surveillance is about collecting the data of innocent people, people who are not committing any crimes but are being spied on under the cover of protecting us from terrorists. In other words, in order for us to be protected from terrorists, we all have to be surveilled as if we were all terrorists. And by the way, if our data is being forwarded to three-letter agencies, there's also the question of what's stopping a carrier or even a paying party from collecting the data themselves, independent of a three-letter agency. If there's a possibility of making money in this surveillance world, could they collect our phone and internet traffic data? Of course they could. The equipment is already there, mandated by the government. Now are they? It would depend on economic value, wouldn't it? Could a carrier make money from our data? I don't know. Let's ask Google. Number two, over the air surveillance. There's another major way of spying on our phone and I will generically call it Stingray. This attack is done on the airwaves and is generally categorized as a man in the middle attack. Stingray is a device developed by the Harris Corporation to enable law enforcement agencies or in fact any government entity to spy on any phone. This is generally called an IMSI catcher and there are newer LTE versions with a different name. Stingray is the older GSM version. Many police departments are equipped with Stingray-like devices and this was provided with a grant from Homeland Security to major cities. In Los Angeles where I am, there's an extensive use of Stingray. Stingray was in fact kept secret for many years. People used it without a warrant until recently and because it is such a secret, the capabilities were not fully known. Today we know that the device can listen to phone traffic and internet traffic using a man-in-the-middle attack. The CALEA law was intended and currently being used for active wiretapping, so it's already possible to tap anyone using the CALEA infrastructure, let's say to listen into a drug dealer. Then where does the Stingray technology fit in? Wiretapping capability at the network level is already required to exist by law. And I already mentioned that since the law was put into operation in the 2000s, the hardware for wiretapping is already built into the switching equipment for both phone, voice over IP, and internet. Is this intended for redundancy? As a backup? Or are there hidden capabilities that we don't even know about? The man in the middle capabilities have been researched heavily in hacking circles for years. And there are books that discuss this in detail so you can build your own Stingray or Stingray-like device. But can the device install firmware or firmware with malware or keyloggers? As I explained in another video, binary blobs are unknown code loaded into our cell phones. And apparently, that code is updatable. I don't know the answer to this, but some people have noted suspicious carrier update messages on their iPhones as they pass by certain covert government agency buildings. It is a certainty that many countries have their own versions of Stingray. People on YouTube have made devices that can detect a Stingray man in the middle and have demonstrated these types of attacks while driving by various embassies in Washington, D.C. This has also been demonstrated in YouTube in some EU countries. So far, all the hacks I've mentioned have been hacks to the cell and internet infrastructure. Number three, device surveillance. Are there hacks on the devices themselves? As far as I know, there are no specific laws mandating hacks on the phones themselves. Yet, as you will discover, they do in fact exist. There was a recently discovered attack on phones called Simjacker. This is a discovered attack, discovered in 2019. There may be other undiscovered attacks. 
Clearly, someone else is hacking our phones. A company called Adaptive Mobile Security discovered that there had been direct access to devices using an instruction set called STK or SIM Toolkit and that your phone has a secret built-in browser called the SAT browser. And it can be accessed through some third party sending a silent SMS. In other words, a text that doesn't alert your phone, a secret message. According to Adaptive Mobile Security, they're confident that the exploit is being used by a government contractor. So this raises the question, who built this SAT browser on your phone? How did this government contractor get information on how to access this particular backdoor? Is this part of the CALEA law requirement? From what I understand currently, this SAT browser is some sort of legacy technology that's been around for many years and may not even be used anymore. Apparently it is built into the SIM cards. So Someone at the carry level or the SIM card maker is able to install executable code on a phone via a SIM card. Is this done by Jamalto, the company that makes most of the SIM cards? What enables this capability? Why are silent texts allowed? Why does Apple and Google allow silent texts without interception by the OS? Was Apple and Google aware of the existence of this SAT browser? What other features are meant to be supported by these silent text messages? Does this mean that any organization can release custom SIM cards with custom code? Apparently, the SIM jacker attack is capable of injecting malware to the phone and that this is early research. More information may be forthcoming. What is the involvement of the chip makers, Qualcomm and MediaTek in this particular hack? Are there other undiscovered backdoors that have direct access to the chip firmware? As I discuss in another video, the firmware in the cell baseband itself is updatable using something called FOTA, firmware over the air. So are there other hacks built into the firmware of the baseband itself? How is this connected to the carrier updates we occasionally get on our phone? Is this injected code sent to the SIM card or to the baseband firmware? Why is it necessary to build spying backdoors at the phone level when you can wiretap anyone at the phone network level itself? Or does a direct phone hack reveal data that goes beyond just cell traffic like accelerometers, GPS, Wi-Fi triangulation, and malware insertion? There are layers upon layers of surveillance built into our phone, overlapping and exposed, unfortunately, to other players outside of our government. Beyond these known attacks that I mentioned, there's the supply chain problem. All our phones, including your iPhone, is made in China. Are we 100% certain that there's no microscopic circuitry in there with some other backdoor? Two billion phones made a year and we've delegated our trust to basically a few companies and a single country, China. This video is more of a summary. I will delve deep into the known details of this at the mass surveillance level and all the way to what secrets are in the chips on your phone. I don't have all the answers yet, particularly what goes on on the baseband firmware and the chips. I will need some help on that. Again, if you find yourself curious about how this topic will evolve, please subscribe to this channel and you will not be disappointed. I have a lot of detail coming up. I don't make these things up. After watching these series of videos, you'll probably want to know about hardware kill switches on your phone. Watch my other videos on Linux phones so you can see the connection. Thank you for watching.